more? Yeah. Is that picking up all right? Good? All right. Good enough. All right, let's start off with a word of prayer, if we could. Dear Father, thank you for this Sabbath day. Thank you for the new snow we're getting out there because the older stuff was starting to look pretty ratty. And Dear Father, um, thanks for the Sabbath day. Thanks for everybody that was able to come here. And Dear Father, thank you also for all those that we have that are listening to it online. Dear Father, please bless us with your presence and please teach us as we go so we might understand what you have here for us. We ask this in the name. Amen. All right. Morning, everybody. Morning. <laughs> um, it, it started off uh, Sabbath afternoon, and I usually, because of church and everything, I usually kick Sabbath afternoon and do it with Sunday's lesson. That's just me, the way I do it. And at my house. So when I started doing doing that, um, I, I kind of liked um, the little story that started off. You know, um, it made good sense to me. Um, if any of us have had pets, you know, they're not always what you want. <laughs> you know, or they don't always do the things you're looking for. So, and um, the one that kind of made me really laugh was uh, Waddlesworth. He he just saw the end of it, but boy, it sure gave him an opinion. You know, and he was mad <laughs> that somebody hurt his friend <laughs> and remembered it for some time. So I think when we get to heaven, we're going to have a, how should I say, a different um, understanding of how much pets and that understand. Because I, I remember I was, um, I lived over north of town here a little bit, and um there was a deer that got hit on the road, and a group of deer ran across, but one got hit. And I saw for two, three weeks that group of deer go out, and they'd go and be sniffing and checking that deer out. You know, they, they remembered that, and that gives you a different perspective than sometimes what I had as a hunter, okay? And I hunt, and I liked it, but I, a lot of what I liked about it was that I was out there. So it was fun. So it gives you a different perspective. Um, so anyway, I, I think we'll all learn something when we get to heaven to do with that. So anyway, um, let's start off. Um, I got Isaiah 7-1. If um, I can get one person to look up that, then I got somebody to look up um, 2 Kings 15-37. Okay. And then a third. Okay, you got seven one. Go ahead and read it. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, the resin king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remelah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. Okay. What is that? What, what's that telling us? I, I know you taught last week, so. <laughs> uh, the, these uh, two kings, one from Israel and one from Syria, were about to invade the king of uh, Judah. Mm hmm. And that's what this is telling us. And he wasn't too confident that he could prevail. Well, he, was a little, he was a little bit, uh, well, he knew he didn't have the means whereby to uh, thwart their invasion. So he was trembling. <laughs> He's probably had his knees knocking. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's read Second Kings 15.37. Go for it. In those days, the Lord began to send Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, against Judah. Okay. 
So what's going on here? Go ahead. You know, when it says the Lord was sending them against Judah. Judah chased Yeah. Same, same thing's going on. So he, yeah. it's like, who we. Um, when it says um, the Lord sends, was sending them, how do you view that? This is just like when the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Yeah, yeah they, they, he sent them against Judah to get their attention so they would call on him as their God. But they were, they had slipped so far into idolatry that uh, this king had caused his son to pass through the fire, which meant that he had offered him for sacrifice and they were basically had bought into this heathen practice and uh, amalgamated a, a style of worship that invited the the this um, kind of mixture of of worshiping the god of heaven and these other gods Okay, let's go to Second Kings six twenty four. Jermaine, you want to read that? Sure. And it happened after this that. Ben Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. Okay, then let's go from there to Proverbs 14 uh, 12. Fourteen twelve, please. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. I, I just threw that one in there because that, that one came to mind. But what what does that tell you? You know, it, go ahead. You need to listen carefully for God's voice. Definitely. Um, the title of our lesson this is "When Your World Is Falling Apart." Boy, is there a title that's more fitting for our country right now? I, I just, man, I, I'm telling you, you couldn't split it. And I mean, the opinions are hardcore and it's just ripping it apart. Good. When you think things can't get worse, they do. Yes. That's right. And, I, you know, every, I can remember listening to some of the financial and it's like, oh, man. 21 is going to be so great. And I kept thinking, man, we thought that in 20. And boy, look what happened to us. And I said, I don't see this thing turning around and getting better. I actually think it's going to be worse than 20. <laughs> you know, go ahead. But this shouldn't surprise us because no. this is exactly the signs that we've been expecting from the uh, Matthew 24 and Luke 21. Yep. And that they're just fulfilling right in front of us. I really appreciated your text from Proverbs because it kind of applies to what you're talking about right now. Uh, it applies to things spiritually too, is that sometimes we look at something and we think, you know, this is the way to go. And it's not. The end, the end is death. And so that's really uh, applicable, applicable to our own lives, you know, because we have a tendency to look out, we form opinions, and it doesn't necessarily mean those opinions are right or they're according to God's will. Um, I heard a comment in it on Hope Channel, I think it was, that I heard in um, this one. I just scribbled it down on the bottom of my page, but it says, today's problems are a result of yesterday's solutions. <laughs> and 
that, that one just really jumped out at me, and it, I said, boy, I like that. So anyway, I just thought I'd share that with you in case some of you, I don't know, some of you probably listen to the Hope Sabbath School in it um, as well. So, um, you know, but that one really made me grin. I was like, ooh, I like that. <laughs> Okay, um, Psalms fifty fifteen. Can we look that one up, please? Go ahead. 5015, you said? Please. And call <clears throat> upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Isn't, isn't that the thing that we need to be doing right now? Because I, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I think we're just seeing the tip of this whole thing er, erupting. And every those in this world keep hoping that we're going to go back to what we had. I don't think we're ever going to get back there. I think the world as we know it has changed. But that's my, my personal opinion. That's, you know, that's not something. But I, I think just so many things have changed about it. Um, I got my first shot, my first COVID shot this last week. And yeah, I, I actually... Actually, you used to not get the flu shot until they required us to get it. Because I remember even in nursing school, so there's quite a few years ago, and my roommate got it, and I didn't, and he got sick all year, <laughs> and I didn't. And I said, boy, I'll tell you what. And that helped me form an opinion right there. <laughs> but, you know, taking good care of yourself matters. It, it does. Boy, boy, that really made me form an opinion. So. You know, I kind of looked at myself and I said, what are you doing? But several things went through my mind with getting that COVID shot. And it, um, I deal with every patient I had is 80-some years old, okay? And I have a responsibility to take care of them. And I told myself, I said, Ben, if you got something and gave it to one of them and you hadn't done everything you possibly could to prevent that from happening in it, don't you, how are you going to live with that? And I said, I'm, I'm down there. I picked up the phone, called the health department, told them who it was, what I was doing, signed up, went down, got my shot. Well, that isn't that fun a shot to get. It, no pain. girl that gave it to me did a great job giving a shot. And as a nurse, I know I've been doing this for years. But the next day, whoo-wee, I felt like somebody hit me with a hammer in that arm, you know, and I ached all over, you know. So your body's reacting to whatever was put in. I did not feel good the next day. But then one day later, and I was fine and doing good. But it was like I called a friend of mine, and I'd laughed about it that first day. I said, ah, doesn't seem bad. Hooey. Somebody hit me with a hammer and had a, the next day. Now, I had the, the um, chicken pox when I was younger, and I've had several patients that, had um, the different reaction from that later on. And you can get that multiple times. I had one patient that had three different times. And that is flat ugly and hurts. And though, sometimes it lasts for months. You know, so, you know, I, I had sucked it up and went and down <laughs> and got my shot for that too. <laughs> and uh, a few weeks ago, and because uh, I, I just knew I didn't want to get that, so. But that's not typically me. I'm not somebody that I, I would just assume, you know, do everything I can to avoid taking some of those things. But I got my shot about two hours ago. Okay. <laughs> at the Charlotte Oil Hospital, and I was really impressed with the uh, organization. It's a drive through in the parking lot. Okay. And they had about 20 people out there working to make the whole thing work. And uh, mm -hmm. I still have tomorrow to look forward to. <laughs> well, I gave you a heads up. That's all I can do for you. <laughs> I, okay. Um, I was looking at that verse that you said in Proverbs fourteen twelve, 
uh, where it says, there is a way which seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. And then you compare it to the one we just read in um, Psalms 50, where it says, call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will rescue you, and you will honor me. Um, it made me think about uh, in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So when we lean on our own understanding, we're doing that way that seems right unto man, but leads to death. But when we trust in the Lord with all our heart, like he asks us to, then he will rescue us in those times of trouble. And so... Um, that's, that's where we should be looking in our times of trouble. We should not look to our own understanding and, you know, get all nervous and do what sometimes our head will tell us to do. Our head tells us, you know, that you should say, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> but um, when we lean not on our own understanding and we trust in the Lord, he will direct our path. And it says that in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. So um, I just think that that's the way we should go when we're having our troubles. Yep. But I don't know how the rest of you, but I'm going to inject a little thing in. But um, God has a neat way of working with me. I like it. <laughs> um, it. He'll let me run headlong and... The thing that's kind of neat about him is when he answers your prayer, it isn't like you have any idea how he's going to answer it or when he's going to answer it. And a lot of times, I, I'm not a patient person always. I, I'd like to wish, I wish I was, but it, it just isn't something that comes to me, you know, um, at least not easily. So sometimes I keep like, God, where are you at? What's going on here? Why aren't you doing some of this? You know, and that's pretty tough, you know, sometimes. It's really cool to me because he, he shows you that he has got this and he's got it so well in control. You know, um, I have a cousin. I got a bunch of them, 22, I think, on my dad's side alone. Okay, so that, that's quite a few. But we all over the country. And I've got one of them up in Minneapolis, and, and she's um, almost exactly the same age I am. We're within a month on birthdays, and so we kind of grew up. They lived in Illinois and lived in Wisconsin growing up. And we talk probably every week, once or twice. And we have, politically, we probably have similar opinions and stuff like that. Um, but it's nice to have somebody that agrees with you. But she asked me, she says, Ben, I'm scared to death of end time events and things like that that are coming. She says, how do you not be? And I said, I learned a long time ago that there's not such a thing as somebody's tough enough to endure or get through. Or I said, if nothing else, the military taught you that in a hurry. You know, it doesn't matter who you were, whatever, they can break you down. You know, control your food and your sleep. And th that's just about all it takes to most of us. You know, and you can crumble in a short period of time. So, you know, once you learn that, it's like, hey, I'm not capable of resisting. Or like, hey, I'm going to be great shape and I'll get through this. You know, it isn't. But it's kind of neat to know that God's got it. And I can remember when I left the service... And they really gave me a hard time because I was an Adventist in it when I was in there. And um, I can remember the thing that when I, oh, I got an honorable discharge and everything, but it, when I left in it, I can remember thinking, I'm not in this army, I'm in God's army. Amen. And that is a pretty cool thing. Amen. And, you know, <laughs> you know, we have... Um, we have in our, our, you know, that to re recall on. And I, I told my cousin, I said, look, I said, children of Israel were slaves. 
in the then known empire of the world, okay? And I said, they, as far as that, Egypt was concerned, they thought they were gods, you know, the pharaohs in that. And I said, God, within 10 simple plagues, <laughs> broke that whole country down and made them like, hey, get out of here, okay? <laughs> 10 simple plagues. And I said, then he opened the Red Sea up. And I said, I can't even imagine what that was like to see the walls of water on each side where you could look in and you go across on dry ground. There, there's nobody, nobody can make that happen, short of God, okay? It just can't. And the Egyptians saw it, and they were confident of their, their selves. They went charging right in after them. And boy, those walls came down. And pretty much wiped out the Egyptian army. I don't think anybody survived that that was in there. You know, I don't know how much of the military they had that was stayed back, but I'm telling you that would have been a pretty devastating thing to have happen. But we understand that there was a million and a half people, basically, of Israelites when they left. God took care of them, fed them, watered them, and everything and didn't even let their clothes wear out for 40 years in the wilderness. 40 years, a million and a half people. And I told her that, and she says, huh. And I said, I think he's got this. <laughs> you know, I said, we just have to remember that type thing when you think of it. God knows what's out there and what's coming. And whether you live or die, you know, Stephen, he'd have never guessed that Paul... <laughs> was going to turn around and write more of the scriptures and everything else, you know, and be converted, right. you know. Um, we serve an amazing God. Yeah, no doubt. And it just, we just have to remember where we're coming from and where we came from. And we're well taken care of. Go ahead. One thing that I really liked that this lesson pointed out well, King Ahaz was not serving the Lord, and God was trying to get his attention. Mm -hmm. God came after him. Mm -hmm. He came after him, like the, the story of the, the prodigal's father running to meet him. And, and that's what God does to us. Sometimes we don't have right perspectives on things, and, um, or, or we just kind of feel lost in the overwhelming circumstances and stuff, but... God doesn't, doesn't leave us there. He comes after us. <laughs> yeah. And I really liked that. Yes, you bet. It's kind of neat to, um, it's neat to have somebody that's inv involved enough in your life that they, you know they want to be there. Think about your spouse or whatever. You know, if you had a spouse that just showed up because you said, hey, I need you here. That's one thing, but it's another one that says, hey, I choose to be there, and I want to stand by your side. That's where God's at. Go ahead. It does say in the scripture that the purpose of Jesus coming was that he came to seek and to save the lost. So that's why he came, was mm -hmm. to seek us out. He came to seek for us until he found us, and then he was going to work with us until we accept him. Yep. And so, um, yeah, that, that's amazing to me. <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, um, the, I'm going to jump ahead to Monday's lesson here. And it says, um, why did the Lord tell Isaiah to take his son, Shir Jashub, with him? Somebody look up Isaiah 7 3. Good. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and Shir Jashub, your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the Fuller's Field. Is that what you wanted? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, 
So Ahaz would be um, startled when Isaiah greeted him. I, I thought that was kind of neat too. <laughs> Go ahead. What's interesting to me in here is that um, the king is out checking out his water supply because he knows that the first thing that the uh, invading army is going to do is one of the biggest things they're going to do is cut off their water supply. And he knows that in a short time they're going to need it. And Isaiah meets him with his son. And <coughs> the son's name, I'm trying to remember what it means. Uh, a remnant shall return. That's where a, I was going A remnant next, yeah. shall return. And uh, Ahaz must have wondered why he brought his son along. And, and uh, uh, because he, in his life, his sons didn't mean too much to him. Not if you're offering them to idols. Um, remnant shall, re um, shall return a remnant of whom would be a question to ask and then um, shall return from what go ahead it is a very interesting and the, the lesson brings this out that a remnant shall return but what exactly does that mean mm. and uh, you know, and the lesson points out that it could be that God was trying to appeal to Ahaz, which way are you going to have it? What is your decision going to be? Are you going to return to me, or is there going to be a remnant that's going to go into captivity? And of course, we know years down the road, that's what happened, that, a, that there's a group that did go into captivity and then a group that did come back, but that wasn't God's plan. It wasn't his desire. He desired them to return to him Amen. and uh, that he could save them from the calamities and disasters. And that's what God's desire for us is as well. Following God, save, it's not saying there's no difficulties or challenges. There is, but he wants to save us from dis greater disasters that we would do ourselves if we're not following him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it, it says, um, sounded like an ominous message from God about people going into captivity or was it about returning to God in the sense of repenting? Yeah. Okay, how did God's message address the king's situation? Isaiah 7, 4 through 9. Someone want to read that when you get it? And say unto him, Take heed and be quiet, fear not, neither be faint hearted, for the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of reason with Syria and of the son of Remaliah, because Syria, Ephraim, <coughs> excuse me, the house of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it. And let us make a breach therein for us, and let it, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason. And within threescore and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. Now, what would you think if you were getting ready to do or make decisions and God told you that? I mean, who, who can predict the future? Okay? I mean, Seriously, I, I can't tell you what's going to happen next week, probably even tomorrow. Yeah. Okay? Um, you know, it, it's interesting, but, um, you know, that to me, God's accurate 100% of the time. You know, and you have to think that as a king of Judah, he would have been familiar with the history of Israel. Okay, I mean, I can't imagine not being. Go ahead. 
also, when you look at verse 4, it kind of points us back to uh, Psalm uh, 46.10, where it says, Be still and know that I am God. And so he's encouraging Ahaz there to, all right, you just, you just settle back. This is one of the things where you're trying to do this your way. If you come back to me, I'll do it my way. Just step back and let me work. Pay attention to me. Um, I just jotted down a couple of questions, but is it who has a full understanding of God? You know, um, go ahead. I, I thought it was interesting, too, like Frank said, you know, in this verse, he says, take heed and be quiet and don't fear, don't be faint-hearted. And it, and it made me think about what, something we practice today called mindfulness. Okay, and I wrote the definition of that down. It says, okay. mindfulness is the basic human ability to be fully present aware of where we are and what we're doing and not to be overly reactive to or overwhelmed by what's going on around us. And this, this pointed out one more step in there that's left out of that, that that I didn't realize. So I was pretty excited about that. It says that we need to pray and cultivate the capacity to understand, <clears throat> excuse me, from God's perspective, what is happening around us. And so when you ask, you know, what would you think if God told you that, you know, do we trust him? Mm -hmm. You know, do we trust him? What we see that, that may be very disturbing and overwhelming to us. Mm -hmm. You know, we can practice mindfulness and do some deep breathing and try to not be overwhelmed by our circumstances, but we have to go back and see, you know, where God is, what do, is his perspective, what does his word say, and where we can find that, that peace yeah. regardless of what's going on. That was and that's hard. <laughs> yeah, that was my next question I had here. Do we trust God? Go ahead. This is a very interesting story, and I think it has a. It speaks a lot to us as well. Going along with what Diana was saying, is you know it looked to King Ahaz like he was in serious trouble. I mean, he's got a couple powers that are knocking on his door that are both stronger than he is and uh, if either one attacked him he was in trouble but with both of them attacking him he's like doomed mm -hmm. and god says you know just be quiet don't be afraid don't be faint-hearted and then he ends in verse 9 says if you believe you will be established he tells him what's going to happen but he says if you believe well, we know the end of the story that he didn't really believe and he kind of got things in a bigger mess th than it was. But, you know, what I was just processing here is we cannot see, and you were mentioning, we cannot see tomorrow. Right. We see events that maybe concern us. We see uh, things that this is how we think it's going to come down because of this, 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 and this. But that's what Ahab was seeing too. Mm -hmm. uh, not Ahab, I'm sorry, Ahaz. And uh, he, I mean, to him, this is what was looked like it was going to happen, and he needed to deal with it. We need to educate ourselves that God alone knows the future, and we've got to trust him even when it looks like it's I impossible, because it looked like that to Ahaz. The invitation is God, to God is, if you believe, you'll be established. We leave that with God, and we trust in him and seek not to be afraid. You got a couple of hands. <laughs> That's good, guys. Because <laughs> it, it, I'll leave the speaker or the preaching to pastor. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll take uh, after after this. I'll try to take heed and be quiet too. <laughs> no, I don't even think. <laughs> you know about the it. things that Pastor Cody was talking about. Things that you were talking about previously reminds me of a verse in Luke twenty-one. I believe it is that when you see these things come to pass, look up. Lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. It's important also for those of us who've been following the Lord for a long time to think of the many times that he's resolved issues for us in his own way and use those to build our faith for the future. Mm -hmm. I think I was talking to Pastor this last week. I told him, I said, you know, it, one of the 
um, Hope Sabbath School. They have a daily Hope Sabbath School, and then they have one that covers the lesson that we're presently on. And I was listening to the daily one. And when I was, I, it, it was on the Holy Spirit. And I know we've covered that here in Sabbath School before. But anyway, it's nice to go over it. But it was telling a whole bunch of different ways that the Holy Spirit deals with us. And that, and that was a pretty cool thing to me. Because it, it, if you just asked me before, I would have told you. I said, well, you know, yeah, he's a power. You know, but he's actually an individual. Okay? And I actually think he really loves us. Okay? As individuals. And it, it's neat because there's three of them, but there's never ever any conflict between them. It always just flows. One points to the next, to the next, and it just works. And with all the stuff that we got going on in our country right now, it is be such a blessing not to have controversy. You know, because when they show, I don't care if it's the senator or the House discussing things, there is so much hate and the way they represent, you know, talk to each other, there's no respect or anything. And it's like, oh man. And that, so to me, I just found another reason that I can't wait to get to heaven. Amen. Okay, because I am so over it. I always kind of cringed before on a political year before the election. And we had the election and it's gotten worse. So anyway, enough. Um, I'm going to jump to Wednesday's lesson now here. In that, in a sign, sign of a son is the title. Um, there was a um, an offer of a sign as deep as Sheol, and I looked it up just to make sure I knew what Sheol was. In a, in a place of darkness to which the dead go is the definition it gave me. Okay. Um, this was also just a little over 700 years before Christ come. Okay. So I thought that was kind of neat. Um, let's start off with Matthew 1, 21 to 23. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Okay. I'm going to just throw out a couple of questions, okay? For a woman to have... A child happens all the time. Okay? There's nothing out of the ordinary with that. <laughs> I didn't say it was easy. Okay? Don't go there. Okay? You're trying to put me in. A, yeah. Okay? It, it does. It, it happens all the time. Okay? Um, but the thing that makes this one here jump out to me how does a virgin do it? Okay? That makes it very different. Okay? So the whole idea that a virgin would have a child never happened before, never has happened since, as far as I know. Okay? So that's what made that different. And then the last part, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. That means God with us. That's a pretty neat thing. Um, I think you see all through the Old Testament the temple or their tent that they had they set it up in the middle of the children of Israel and God dwelt there amongst them it says in the new earth that 
kind of the sun's going to be insignificant. The light yeah. that's going to be around us is God or Jesus, you know, that's going to light that up. Um, when you look at Moses, when he was exposed to just seeing the backside of God, whatever, when he came down, he glowed so much that the Israelites wanted him to wear a covering. Um, but it just, to me, it's really cool that we have somebody that loves us enough that he wants to spend time with us. Amen. Um, if you were in a relationship and you, somebody didn't want to hang out with you or be around you or anything like that, how good a relationship are you? You know, I mean, where's it at? You know, um, you don't have much to me. Anyway, you want that. Somebody wants to be with you. Okay? Um, I'm going to go to Thursday's lesson. Next. Um, God is with us. Okay? And I'm going to read this because I think it explains it as good as I can say it. And I don't know that I can shorten it by, by putting it in my words. So I'm going to just read it. It says, like the name Isaiah's children, Shir Jeshub, um, a remnant shall return, and Maher shall has a hash baz, which means swift is booty, speedy is prey. The name of Emmanuel has a meaning. It is literally with us, God. But the commonly accepted translation, God with us, misses something important. As with other Hebrew names of this kind, the lack of, the lack, that lack verbs, the verb to be must be supplied because it is not expressed in Hebrew. So Emmanuel must be translated God is with us. Compare the same words in Isaiah 8.10. Somebody want to look Isaiah 8.10 up? Yes, Isaiah 8.10. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak the word, but it will not stand. For God is with us. Okay. Just as the name Jesus, Greek in short for the Hebrew Yeshua or, or Joshua, means the Lord is salvation, with the verb, again, being supplied compare Isaiah with which means salvation of the Lord okay um, but the name Emmanuel is not just an abstract description it is an assertion of a promise that is fulfilled now God is with us that's pretty good it, it, that just hit me and I said man I made all kinds of notes all around it, but it, I just really liked it. Um, I read a couple of the texts that we had, and I put that to be in there, and it's kind of neat the way that comes out just a little bit more. So if you got time later on, you might read some of those texts and put that to be in it, because I think that gives just a little extra with it, and I'm glad somebody else, because I did my share of foreign language in school, and yet, um, I'm glad somebody else has the wherewithal to compare and fill all the details in on some of that. Um, I admire him for it, but that was never my forte. <laughs> um, there was another one. It talked about Jacob, and even when he was wrestling with God all night, it said, where was he? He was in God's arms. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty neat thing to look at it that way. Because when you're wrestling with somebody, you know, that's not exactly, 
you know, you know, you're, you're fighting hard for an adversary, and Jacob sure thought he had one, and it, and then when he realized what he did have, you know, but it it just it, that was pretty cool. He was in the best place he could ever be. It's in God's arms, you know. So I thought that was pretty neat. Um, I said that already. Um, even though we have the promise that God is with us, what difference does that make if we still face terrible trials and sufferings? That was a question. Um, it, to me, and I think each one of us has our own reasons, but it just, um, if I know God's with me, it sure is nice to be right. <laughs> okay? Um, I think sometimes some people argue vigorously and they know they're wrong, okay? But there's nothing like knowing no matter what, whether you get stomped on or <laughs> run over or whatever, just to know that you're right. And when God's on your side, you know you're right. And it, that's a pretty neat thing to me, okay? Um, There's some of us, um, you know, it talked about um, a little bit in here, but um, summary God brought uh, uh, faith as King Ahaz to circumstances in which he had to make a difficult decision to believe or not to believe. This is the question. Even though the Lord offered him any sign that his imagination could devise, he refused to allow God to demonstrate a reason why he would or should believe. Instead, he chose as his friend the king of Assyria. How many of us sometimes have chosen the wrong friends? Just something to think about. All right. Um, let's go ahead and pray and close it up. And thank you very much, everybody, for participating in putting in because that's really what makes the class fun and neat and it really is helpful from somebody on this end so anyway thank you much and let's bow our heads dear Heavenly father thank you for the sabbath day and dear Heavenly father as we enter into the next service please bless us with your presence again and dear Heavenly father please teach us everything you have us know help us so we can really watch who we we choose as our friend. And dear Father, please bless us with your presence so that we know that we are in your arms. We ask this in the name. Amen.